everyone. I am uh, grateful to be here, and I want to thank, of course, Pastor Fuju and uh, my That's sister, Tohin. Lovely um, to be a part of this. I'm really, really grateful. And I feel like the first speaker just stole everything I want to say. <laughs> you know, as an activist, I was just sitting there shouting, yes, yes. Um, but I'm honored to be here and just grateful to have my family, the support of my family and my friends, uh, those of you who are physically here and those of you um, who are watching uh, on television or on social media. So growing up as a young child in Benin City, my mother would often trace our feet on pieces of paper um, just before she was traveling to the U.S. or to England. Now, once she arrived, she would awkwardly take these drawings of our feet to a shoe store to estimate our shoe sizes. And when she returned back to Benin, we were always overjoyed, right? Regardless of whether the shoes were too big, were too small, or just the right fit. Uh, in my case, they were almost always too small. But regardless, I always wore mine proudly, often opting for pain, because who didn't want to show off new shoes from London? Now, my younger sister would sometimes have the same problem, and so because my feet were actually bigger than hers, I would wear her shoes for a day or two to stretch them out, to create more space for her to walk more comfortably. You know, I did this for several years until we finally started accompanying my mom overseas, but at that point, I think it was too late. You know, I still have one small toe that didn't quite recover. But as I grew older, though, I realized that stretching tight shoes, creating more space for other people, became a consistent theme in my life. It is the impetus for why I do what I do. It's the way that I move through the world. You see, my fundamental belief, as you heard in the video, is that every woman is entitled to live a life of dignity, a life where she is not robbed of agency, a life that is graced with self-determination and free from sexual exploitation. Creating space for other people is what compelled me after I read a book called Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer to step into the purpose that had been beckoning to me for my entire life. You see, I started reading the book on a Friday and I came across a line in a poem that said, ask me whether what I have done is my life. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. You see, I'm a lawyer by training, don't judge me. Um, but at that point in October of 2013, I'd been practicing law as a partner at a prestigious law firm in New York for over 10 years. And according to my white male partners, um, I was the epitome of black female success in the United States. I had the nice corner office, I had a lucrative salary, I was supervising a large group of junior associates. I had the respect of my colleagues and my clients, one of them who often referred to me as a classy bulldog. Um, but yet, I was unfulfilled because I was not doing what my life had called me to do. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. I finished the book that Sunday evening, and with a burning sense of urgency and confidence in purpose, on Monday morning, I walked into my senior partner's office, and I handed him my resignation letter. I resigned. Because until you step into what your life has called you to do, there will always be a misalignment. The gift of discomfort will continue to haunt you. And the words of this poem by Mark Nepo will continue to echo in your soul. Let no one keep you from your journey. No rabbi or priest. No mother who wants to who wants you to dig for treasures that she misplaced. No father who won't let one life be enough. No lover who measures their worth by what you might have to give up. No voice that tells you in the night that it can't be done. Let nothing dissuade you from seeing what you see or feeling the winds that make you want to dance or go where no one has gone before. You are the only explorer, your heart the unreadable compass. Let no one keep you from your journey. And so, 
I courageously started on my own path. I founded my NGO, Pathfinders, which unapologetically stretches tight shoes and creates space for women and girls at the tables of their lives. Our mission is to eradicate sex trafficking and the sexual exploitation of women and girls in Nigeria. We're both rehabilitation and prevention focused. The name Pathfinder was a nickname that my father, the late, great Archbishop Benson Idahosa, gave me when I was nine years old. And like you heard in the video, he would call me his Pathfinder because he would say that no matter where he was in the world, and many of you who know him know that he traveled extensively, he would say that no matter where he was in the world, I would always track him down. I wasn't okay with just leaving a voicemail for him or voice message for him. I actually had to speak to him directly. And so he started calling me his Pathfinder. And so when I started thinking about a name for the organization, this made sense because it's not only who I am, it's what my father called me prophetically, but it's what we're trying to do for these women and young girls is to help them find their path out of injustice, out of trauma, out of sexual exploitation. It is our way of providing sustenance in the shadows. It is our way of allowing access to possibility, to hope. Two things that young Nigerian impoverished women don't believe they have access to. But the reality is that as you sit here today and you listen to me, there are over 40 million people that are trapped in human trafficking. 71% of them are women and girls. And think about this for a minute. There are actually more people currently enslaved today than at any other point in human history. Human trafficking, or modern day slavery, encompasses both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. It is a $150 billion per year industry. It's the third most lucrative illicit business in the world, right after the trafficking of drugs and arms. Of the $150 billion, that are made annually, almost 100 billion of that is earned off the bodies of women and girls in sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. The average global cost of a lifetime slave is $90, 32,000 naira. And for $90, a woman who was trapped in sex slavery can earn her trafficker an average of $100,000, i.e. 36 million naira every single year. And so for 32,000 naira, you can purchase a lifetime slave and she can earn you 36 million naira every single year. That's one heck of a return on investment. Uh, because unlike guns and drugs, human bodies are the only ones that can be recycled over and over and over again. But let's talk about what's going on in our beloved country, Nigeria, one nation bound in freedom, peace, and unity. Nigeria is considered a source, transit, and destination country when it comes to human trafficking. And according to the latest reports, Nigeria ranks 32nd out of 167 countries that were recently assessed. It is believed that Nigeria has 1.38 million slaves within the country. I believe that number is considerably higher. But what we are most infamously known for is for the sex trafficking of our women abroad, out of Nigeria into Europe. This atrocity of epic proportions which strips bare the souls of our women and girls is what my amazing team and I humbly devote our lives to eradicating. But in order to do this work, I first had to look at myself, to look at the women and girls that we partner with, to look at Nigeria and identify three lies that we've told ourselves about the value of our women and girls and how that has led to us becoming infamously known around the world on the issue of sex trafficking. Because at the end of the day, only by confronting these lies, debunking them and replacing them with the truth, will we be able to we will be able to emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. Now, several years ago, my, my mother went to visit my grandfather at his home on the famous Igun Street in Benin. She arrived to find a young girl who could not have been more than 16 or 17 years old, cowering in the corner. 
When my mother inquired from her father as to who this child was, my grandfather casually informed her that she had been given to him as a gift. A human being, a gift. And so because my grandfather was a person of influence, some father in his infinite wisdom decided to gift him his daughter. And so because she was now his property, he was free to do with her as he pleased. Anybody who knows my mother knows that it didn't take my mother long before she carried that small girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, pack your bags, my dear. You will not key my father. <laughs> but she was making a point. She was making a, a point. And so, but my grandfather's response to that, he was indifferent. Because you see, this was not the first or the last time that something like this would happen. I think about that little girl who's now a woman often, and I wonder what became the story of her life. It is one of many stories that has haunted me over the years, because the reality is that we have a complicated, tortured relationship with slavery and the devaluation of human bodies here in Nigeria. What is the value of human life here? It is undeniable that entrenched somewhere deep in the great Benin Kingdom's rich, profound history is a page that's buried deep in the 15th to the 18th centuries that reveals our entrenched involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. Along with ivory and palm oil and pepe, we sold our female captives of war. As the demand from the West grew, we eventually embarked on the sale of our own women and then men, because you see, everything and everyone has a price. That evaluation and devaluation of our women and girls, the idea of women being bartered for and traded, has morphed over varying forms over the years, but it still remains prevalent in our society. It's the reason why we're comfortable trading our women in marriage for what we refer to as a bride price. It is the reason why even in 2018, one of our teenage survivors, a 17-year-old girl, was used as what we wittingly did call money wife, collateral, when her father was unable to repay a debt to a man 50 years her senior. It is the reason why many of our young women are forced to exchange sex for marks in university. Hashtag Monica Osaige and sex for food in our internally displaced persons camps. Because you see, our society has taught us that every woman, every young girl, has a financial value. And so it's no wonder that in Edo State, many of our impoverished young women have adopted this depraved value system that our long history, our society, our traditions over centuries has used to define them. It is no wonder that many of them have started to view prostitution as an alternative to poverty. It is no wonder that annually, tens of thousands of our young people are willing to risk their lives in the cemetery that is the Sahara Desert, in the hell that is Libya, and in the graveyard that is the Mediterranean Sea, only to then be commoditized in Europe, to be sold and recycled over and over again. In fact, it is well documented that 90%, over 90% of the women um, who are actually being trafficked for sex from Nigeria are from Edo State, most of them voluntarily and with consent. One in every three of our young women in Edo has been recruited. Sex trafficking overseas, particularly when it comes, um, when it happens with consent, is highly concentrated in Edo State. But Edo State is not the poorest state in the country. We're not the least educated, nor do we have the fewest job opportunities. So why is that? Why would so many of our young women volunteer to be trafficked, even knowing that they may be working in prostitution? It is because many of them have embraced the first lie, that our value as women is inextricably tied to our sexuality. We have become enslaved to this lie that is deeply embedded in the culture in Edo State and is literally eradicating a significant portion of a generation of young women between the ages of 15 to 24 in our country. But what if we were to start to speak the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? 
What if we change the narrative, engage in a mindset reset, a paradigm shift, and instead of being a society that values wealth and class and material things, choose to value our women and girls simply because they are worthy of value? Because you see, only when we can take the price tag off of our girls and convince them and convince their impoverished mothers, many of whom are the primary negotiators of the, of the contracts with the traffickers, will we then be able to convince them that their lives are actually more valuable here in Nigeria than in broken pieces in Italy. You know, I'm fortunate enough that my work with Pathfinders allows me to sound the alarm on the issue of modern day slavery all around the world. Last May, I boarded a flight uh, from London to Lagos and I happened to be sitting next to a white English businessman who struck up a casual conversation. And where in Nigeria are you from, young lady? <laughs> Edo State, I said proudly. But the pointedness of his very next question alarmed me. And what exactly is your country doing about your sex trafficking problem? So fast forward a year to this past May, I was in Italy to speak about our prevention and rehabilitation efforts. And after a busy day, I casually strolled through an open air market looking for a gift for my mother. On numerous occasions, and many women who are here, you guys know what it's like when you're walking through a market. I was stopped and prodded and jabbed by merchants hawking their wares. And again, I was casually asked the same question. Ciao, Bella, where are you from? When I finally decided to respond, I actually said rather angrily, I'm from Nigeria. Where in Nigeria? Edo State. Immediately canvassing my body up and down. The guy leaned in. You here for job? <laughs> I was insulted. And simultaneously, I was ashamed. Because you see, our reputation as Edo women, as Nigerian women, precedes us. And to have other people tell it, the problem of sex trafficking in Nigeria is one that is insurmountable. In Edo State, sex trafficking is such a part of our functioning economy that our local Western Union is one of the busiest in the world. In fact, one researcher found that 80% of the homes in Edo State are somehow affiliated with trafficking, 80%. That means a large percentage of our young women have grown up defining success by the minute percentage of women who have traveled abroad, paid off their debt to their trafficker, are now madams of their own and therefore able to send remittances to support their families back in Nigeria. In fact, for our working poor, Italy has become synonymous with lifting one's family out of abject poverty. And so as a result, we too have bought into the second lie that eradicating trafficking in Nigeria, particularly the inner state, is an insurmountable feat. Beniges, na so dem be. But let's consider the subject objectively. Nigeria has a population of 180 plus million, and projecting our growth rate in Edo State from our last census in 2006, only about 4.1 million of those people actually live in Edo State. In the women ages 15 to 4, 24 demographic, that's the age group of women who are most vulnerable to being trafficked, there are about 470,000 of us. We know that poverty is one of the primary indicators of vulnerability to trafficking. And so using Edo State's poverty rate of 19.2%, approximately 90,000 of that 470,000 are arguably the most vulnerable to trafficking. 90,000. That's only a little bit over the size of one World Cup stadium full of women and girls. And speaking of World Cup, by the way, Statistics indicate that at least 2,000 Nigerian women were trafficked into Moscow. I know of at least one that was murdered two weeks ago while working as a prostitute. But back to the 90,000. What if we were to identify these young women and girls, really seek to identify those who are most vulnerable to trafficking, and find a way to provide sustainable economic and educational empowerment for them, while simultaneously addressing their mindset 
and cognitively restructuring their belief system? Could we potentially drastically reduce and work towards eradicating sex trafficking, which has become a weapon of mass destruction in Edo State? That's what Pathfinders, my NGO, has determined to do by two of our projects, Project Restore and HERS. These are two projects that will identify the most vulnerable in Edo State and provide customized interventions in all 18 local government areas to counteract the likelihood that at least one third of these young women will be recruited. We're utilizing an interdisciplinary methodology that's combining human rights, cognitive restructuring, and economic development as a solution to sex trafficking. Perhaps if Faith had had access to this support, she might still be alive today. She grew up in Benin City. She was poor and uneducated. She had no access to sustainable economic opportunities. And because she grew up in a society that culturally has been complicit in promoting sex trafficking, she volunteered to be trafficked overseas in, hopes, in the hopes of improving her life. It was in Libya that she was initially sold for the first time. And then in Moscow, she was forced into prostitution to repay a debt of $45,000 to her traffickers. She told me that every single day, every day, think about this, she was forced to have sex with anywhere between 12 to 15 men, earning five to $10 per customer. Imagine how long it will take to pay back $45,000. She was repeatedly raped. She was beaten. She was verbally and emotionally abused. As a result of the assault on her body, she developed repeated kidney infections. But because her traffickers were unwilling to afford her the dignity to obtain antibiotics, those repeated infections progressed to kidney disease. Yet, her traffickers forced her to continue to work because at that point she had only repaid $27,000 of her debt. Close to death in 2012, she was discarded on the streets of Moscow because she became useless to her traffickers. At that point, her one wish was to return to Nigeria to be reunited with her four-year-old daughter. So working with several of our partners, Faith returned to Nigeria in November of 2015. It was our intention to provide her with six weeks of dialysis treatments while we desperately tried to fundraise the $35,000 that she needed to secure a tr kidney transplant. There was no help coming, not from government, and trust me, I tried. There was no help coming from the private sector, and there certainly was no help coming from her impoverished family. Those six weeks turned into six months at the end of which we still were unable to raise the $35,000. I remember the last conversation that I had with Faith and the words that convict and inspire me to continue to do this work. I'm dying! Auntie, I'm dying! Faith passed away in September of 2016. She was survived by her mother her brother, and her eight-year-old daughter. She was 31 years old, and she still owed $18,000. You see, Faith's story is not much different from the reality of the stories that I hear from our survivors on a daily basis. Most of them leave Nigeria, not because they have given up on their country, but because they believe that their country has given up on them. Happy Independence Day for who? Most of them leave Nigeria with one thing that the traffickers have been able to manipulate and restore back to them, hope. They may know that they will work in prostitution, but most of them are completely ignorant to the reality of what they will face when they arrive. Most of the women that we worked with owe a debt of anywhere between $35,000 to $50,000 to their madams for smuggling them into Europe even though the trip costs an average of $2,500. The madams, most of who were trafficking victims themselves at one point, seized their passports. They forced them to do things that nobody could ever imagine. Many of them had sworn juju oaths before shrines, before native doctors, and even before some pastors. 
Their movement is limited, it's, it's restricted. They're beaten, they're raped, some by up to 15 men at a time. Abortions are readily used as birth control. In fact, one of our survivors told me on Friday that within eight hours of an abortion, her Madame JJJ escorted her back on the streets. In addition to repaying this debt that I mentioned through prostitution, our sisters are forced to pay their madams for rent, for food, for the clothes on their backs, and for the, co um, for the condoms, which most of their customers will reject. Most will never send a single cobble back to support their families in Nigeria until and unless that debt has been repaid. On average, this takes anywhere from three to five years with their young bodies having withstood sex with anywhere between four to 6,000 men. They return back to Nigeria in broken pieces. And so before you judge them, there but for the grace of God go I. Nobody chooses that. These are the women that we partner with to rebuild broken dreams. These are the women whose voices we amplify because make no mistake, Every woman has a voice. No one is voiceless. And so we craft solutions, we craft interventions, because we seek a Nigeria, for what, because what we seek for Nigeria is structural transformation that is embedded in our deep desire to see our women move from poverty reduction to wealth creation. We're looking ahead, thinking progressively and planning for a Nigeria that will be impacted by climate change, by unsustainable population growth, by rapid globalization and urbanization in a community and in an economy where the youth unemployment rate is already leading to irre irreversible atrocity. And we're doing so because we are visionaries and we see things differently and we know that what is happening in Edo State, what's happening in Nigeria is not insurmountable. Because you see, culture is a, is a social construct that was created by people. And so it can be demolished, and in this case, completely restructed by the people. Finally, this is Nigeria. Everybody be criminal. <laughs> Abi, this is a pervasive thought, the third and final lie that has infiltrated our country and the minds of our people to the point of paralysis. But the truth is that there are those of us, you and me, who believe in the potential of this country and are doing everything that we can to change her narrative. Isn't that right? Yes. You see, the system is designed to overwhelm us, to paralyze us, so that those of us who are courageous throw up our hands and we walk away. But as Thomas Jefferson once said, once injustice becomes law, Resistance becomes duty. Free people, free people. It is actually possible to love your country and yet speak truth to power in the face of systemic injustice, in the face of blatant corruption that is literally killing our youth. The two postures are not diametrically opposed. In fact, it is our love of country that compels us to speak and to amplify the muted voices of others. We've all heard it said that power concedes nothing without demand. And so we cannot sit idly by and complain about the lack of political will to change our economy, to change our education system, to change our infrastructure or the lack thereof. We, the people, are the ones who are tasked with the opportunity to craft the political will of our leadership. We are the ones who get to choose what platforms they campaign on because those platforms have been informed by our voices and what is important to us. That is how you create political will. But where there is failed government, doing nothing is not an option because the implications on doing, of doing nothing, the implications of slavery on our mental and physical health, on our education, on our crime rates, on our economy is far too extensive. Every year, tens of thousands are engaging in the mass exodus and the brain drain from Nigeria. And every year, hundreds, if not thousands, are dying in the Sahara, dying in Libya, dying in the Mediterranean. Does anybody remember the 26 Nigerian girls whose bodies were found on the Mediterranean Sea last November? They were mothers, they were sisters, they were daughters. 
their meat. And like faith, they died as victims, buried nameless, six feet under in a foreign land that is not their own, with nothing but a number on their graves. A15D007 was Nigerian girl number 23. The truth is that Nigeria has never confronted her history of slavery and the human rights abuses that we fostered. We have never truly confronted the degradation and depreciation of women and the patriarchy that's written into our customs, into our religions, into our laws. We have never ever opened up our palms to look and acknowledge the blood on our hands. Four years, 168 days later, where are 112 girls from Chibok? 224 days later, where is Leah Sharibu? But your voice will never count if it's not heard. Your intentions will never be known if they're not acted upon. What small step can you begin to take today, today to change our narrative? As a parent, can you confirm, can you commit to affirming the image and the likeness of God when you see it in your children every day? As a man, can you stand as a gender advocate? Because we need you. Men, we need you. We need you to teach your boys that women are not objects for male consumption. We need you to teach your boys that women's liberation is as much theirs as it is ours. As a politician, will you shun corruption and devote a larger percentage of the budget to women's empowerment programs? As a private sector, can you join us in job creation, in diversifying the economy, in economic empowerment? As a Nigerian, will you vote in 2019 for candidates that prioritize people over profits and are not just simply benevolent dictators? <laughs> will, you, will you commit to using your social media platforms to raise awareness about trafficking? Will you help us launch Project Restore? If you see something, will you say something? Now is the time to courageously confront the past, to debunk the lies, and to speak truth to power because every minute that you wait, somebody else is forced to wait for you. Every day that you delay, somebody else is forced to endure. Miles Monroe once said, die empty. And to me, a life that negates the service of others is wasted. In the words of Rabbi Hillel, if I am not for myself, then for who? If not now, then when? Nigeria awaits. Our future awaits. And if you listen closely enough, you will hear the sound of our children beckoning for freedom. Free people, free people. Will you join me in stretching tight shoes? Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yvonne.